This is part of our series, Dante and dot, dot, dot. So today we have, we have Dante and Botticelli, or Botticelli and Dante Reborn. Um, it's a pleasure to um, introduce Joseph Luzzi, who I think it's not the first time he's been to the Casa, so a returnee. He is professor of comparative literature uh, and faculty member at Italian study, of Italian studies at uh, Bard College, and came down on the train today down the Hudson River and was recently a Wallace Fellow at Harvard's Villetati, where he was writing a cultural history of Dante's Divine Comedy that will appear with Princeton University Press. His talk today is part of a new book called Botticelli's Secret, The Last Drawings and the Discovery of the Renaissance, which will be published by W.W. W. Norton. Luzzi is the author of Romantic Europe and the Ghost of Italy, Yale, 2008, which received the MLA's Scalione Prize for Italian Studies. He's also the author of A Cinema of Poetry, Aesthetics of the Italian Art Film, Johns Hopkins, 2014, a finalist for the International Prize, the Bridge Book Award, My Two Italys, Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux in 2014, a New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice, and In a Dark Wood, What Dante Taught Me About Grief, Healing, and the Mysteries of Love, HarperCollins, 2015, which has been translated into Italian, German, and Korean. His essays and reviews have appeared in the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Chronicle of Higher Education, TLS, Book Forum, and American Scholar, among others. And his scholarly writing has appeared in PMLA, Modern Language Notes, Modern Language Quarterly, Raritan Italica, Studies on Voltaire in the 18th Century, and so on. His media appearances include a profile in The Guardian and an interview with National Public Radio. Among his honors are a Dante Society of America Essay Prize, Yale College Teaching Prize, fellowships from the National Humanities Center and Yale's Whitney Humanities Center. The first American-born child in his Italian immigrant family, Luzzi was named Cittadino Honorario, Honorary Citizen of Acri Calabria in 2017. On a personal note, Joe is thrilled to be back in the NYU community as he received his MA in French literature with work in Italian literature as well from NYU in 1994. Joe Luzzi is somebody who, um, who believes in bringing Dante to the people, let's put it that way. He's um, not just Dante, but uh, Italian culture in general. And he has a very interesting um, personal background, which you can read about in these two books of his, about his experiences in life and uh, what his uh, reading of Italian literature um, did for him and, and what he did for Italian literature um, because of these experiences and how the two interacted. So I'm very happy to have him here today. Would you join me in welcoming Joe Luzzi? Thank you so much, Allison, for that generous uh, introduction. It really feels like a homecoming to be here. How's the sound in the back? Good. I usually like to speak, walk around stage, but I've been told I have to stay in the vicinity of this mic. So within I'll do. Your halo. Oh, what's that? Within your halo. Within my halo. Okay. Um, so you know, it's thrilled to be here. As as Allison mentioned, I have a degree um, from NYU, a master's degree. Um, it's a strange time. I got it um, when I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So I was actually working full time. And I would come to NYU at the end of the day in like a suit and tie. Needless to say, I didn't make many friends in the classroom. Uh, but I took most of my classes at night and I was sort of getting the MA um, just to see what would happen. And then I, I was, made, you know, principally in French literature, but I took classes in Italian literature in this building. And John Frachero was one of my teachers. And he was so extraordinarily brilliant and so captivating a speaker. It was one of the... Um, inspirations to subsequently go into Italian studies. So um, I, I owe a lot to NYU. Um, one other thing I want to say before the talk, I'm going to read the paper today, but it's going to be written in an ex hopefully an accessible style. Uh, it's for a kind of this general reader. It will be published by Norton. This research comes from the book that will be published by Norton. 
And on a kind of intellectual epistemological level, though, I would say one thing I've learned writing this book, um, my previous two books were memoirs, and um, that's enough. Two memoirs, that's your limit. <laughs> okay? Um, so I struggled to find a new writing style after that because I, was go I wanted to go back to scholarship. But I felt that kind of writing for a broader audience stuck with me. And what I've come to really believe in writing this book is that there's a place in literary criticism for narrative work. Uh, this is, will be told in narrative fashion. I think storytelling has a place. I think it can be one of the things we think about as we address the crisis in the humanities and maybe even a crisis in literary criticism to find ways of opening up the text we write about. Um, when I was in graduate school, one of my teachers, Jeffrey Hartman, a great scholar of romanticism, used to coin the phrase um, to find the answerable style. You know, how do you respond to the work? What's the best mode? And I think to, main, to capture some of the magic and mystery of the original, sometimes it's good to answer a story with a story. Uh, so what's the story I'm going to tell you today? The story I'm going to tell you today uh, is one that I kind of stumbled upon um, as I was doing my research at Villa Itati. As I, Allison mentioned, I'm writing this book, a kind of biography of the Divine Comedy that will come with Princeton, but I, I came across this these drawings that I hadn't really thought much of in the past, you know, Botticelli's Dante drawings. Uh, I knew they were beautiful, I thought they were charming, but I didn't really think there was a great story there. And there was this beautiful facsimile edition at Villa Itati um, that I was able to spend some time with from the, you know, a facsimile of the, an original publication in the late 1800s. And the more I looked at the drawings, all of them, there's almost a hundred of them, the more I became convinced that there was a great vision here in Botticelli of Dante, and that story needed to be told. And then I found out that the, the, the drawings themselves had this unbelievable history. And I thought, okay, this is worth going into. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. I should say this, when I sent in my prospectus, I was going to talk more about the race to define the Renaissance and the rise of the connoisseur. With three small children, I think my eyes were bigger than my stomach. Um, so I'm going to do a lot of Botticelli and Dante, and I'll get to this, but I'm really going to lay out the kind of the overall story as well, okay? which I think is actually better for someone hearing about it for the first time. I'd like to start with two quotes, okay? Uh, epigraphs, which I also call epitaphs. Um, the first is from... Dante Gabriele Rossetti, which he's a very interesting figure because he was a pre-Raphaelite, and he's one of the first people that really, you probably won't believe this, but Botticelli had disappeared from the map. As famous as he is today, he was really considered a kind, he wasn't in the pantheon of Michelangelo, Leonardo, even Raphael. He was sort of, you know, people admired him, there was a certain charm to his work, but he really need to be rehabilitated. And uh, Rossetti is one of the people that did this, right? And he has this beautiful poem, Spring by Sandro Botticelli. And he says, what, history, what mystery here is read of homage or of hope, but how command dead springs to answer? I love this because, you know, dead springs, of course, is the primavera, right? How do you get a painting to speak? How do you get this opaque, beautiful work of art to come to life? And what he's saying here is you can to a certain point, but there'll always be a mystery and a veil over it. And that's so true of Botticelli. We know so little about him. The last great biography, I think, of Botticelli, believe it or not, was written by the disciple of Rossetti, by Herbert Horn, in 1907. And it's a completely impersonal work. We know very little about Botticelli as a person. He left nothing in his own hand, no writing, okay? So we, we almost have to look to the paintings to reconstruct the man. The second quote is from a, one of the inventors of the Renaissance as a category, the great Swiss historian Jakob Burkhardt, right? And Burkhardt, who I spent a lot of time with, both at Itati and afterwards, reading his monumental work um, on the Renaissance, he's really the one we owe the conceptual category to probably more than anyone. Burkhardt said, history is the one field of study that does not begin at the beginning. It took me a while to understand that one. And I thought I knew. I thought I knew something about Dante. I spent many years studying him. And I thought I knew a little bit about Botticelli. 
But the more I spent with them, the more I realized that there was always a beginning that was re retreating before where I was starting. So now that we had that, I'll jump right into the paper. Um, you know, where does our story begin? Our story begins here uh, with the Dead Springs. How do we command them to answer? That was the question that uh, Rossetti asked, right? Um, and who is the person that painted it? We think we know Botticelli, right? Um, but do we? Part one of my talk is called Botticelli Occluded. Each year, more than two million people, two million visitors fill the twin corridors of Florence's Uffizi, the world's preeminent collection of Renaissance art. For some, the encounter with the sublime painting of Michelangelo, Leonardo, and Caravaggio is so overwhelming that it causes rapid heartbeat, dizziness, and even fainting, as they experience Stendhal syndrome. This has actually been studied by a doctor uh, in Florence. The debility. Oh, she was. Okay, so you can verify me. Okay, and her last name is Ma Magherini. Exactly. So this is you know med medical uh, stuff. Um, after whom the condition is named Stendhal syndrome, who actually was a tourist in Florence, and I'm very happy to say he was carrying a copy of Ugo Foscolo's On Sepulchres uh, in Santa Croce when he had his rapid heartbeat. Um, perhaps nowhere is this concentration of beauty more disorienting than in rooms 10 to 14 of the Uffizi, the so-called Sale di Botticelli. The shutters, the shutters whirl and the selfie sticks fly as viewers gape at the Primavera and Birth of Venus, right? Massive paintings whose frolic in gods and goddesses are reproduced on everything from priceless jewelries to cheap keychains and dorm posters, uh, probably at NYU, each year, even Lady Gaga's ribcage. <laughs> in the surge of bodies surrounding these two famous works, it can be easy to overlook an, a painting, the Cestello Annunciation, which Botticelli painted in 1489 for a Florentine monastery. And this is really where I, I decided I needed to write this book. Um, I went to the Uffizi one morning, uh, Saturday morning, 8.45, and I, I had this, you know, this, this encounter with this painting and I saw something. The Annunciation theme is one of the most ha hallowed in the Renaissance an inspiration to Leonardo, Raphael, and the many others who immortalized that ineffable moment when the Archangel Gabriel announced, hence the term Annunciation, to the Virgin Mary that she was to give birth to the Son of God. As marvelous as these other paintings are, none conveys the peculiar mass mystery of Botticelli's Virgin, who seems to be dancing, or at least swaying, her energy concentrated inward, her body enthralled to the divine message that has just been transmitted from Gabriel's fingertips to her own. Mary's gracefulness, to me at least, has nothing little spiritual about it. It is earthy and earthly, a hum of pleasure that we feel in the flesh more than contemplate in the mind. The angel has come to announce the coming of God. Botticelli has come to remind us of the joy of creation. If ever, an historical epic could be conveyed in a single simple gesture, a brushstroke. Here it is, Botticelli's Annunciation of the Renaissance. That word Renaissance is so familiar to us now that it's lost all specificity and original meaning. It was first coined not, this is so important, it was not coined in the 15th century. Scholars know this, but a lot of the public doesn't. It was actually much closer to our own time first used in its sense as an historical category by the 19th century French historian Jules Michelet, who wrote, that pleasant word Renaissance recalls to lovers of beauty not only the advent of a new art and the free play of imagination. For scholars, it is the renewal of classical studies, while for jurists, daylight begins to dawn over the confused chaos of our ancient customs, end quote. Not all of Michelet's peers were so sanguine about the cultural development that took place in 15th century Italy before spreading to the rest of Europe. One influential voice defined the Renaissance as the time when the devil returned to the earth to rule over humankind. Another even more powerful commentator said that with the coming of the secular Renaissance and the disappearance of the more spiritual Middle Ages, all manner of lies and foolishness could now be legitimized. 
Now, obviously, these are broad dichotomies that don't stand to scholarly scrutiny. But what I would emphasize in this term, um, Renaissance, is that the word Renaissance is absolutely dependent on that prefix re. It was an age of rebirth, rediscovery, and reinvention. As much as producing anything new, it demonstrated with monumental force how to reuse, reconsider, and recreate ideas and practices that had either been forgotten or lost. One of these lost, astonishingly enough, was the same painter whose birth of Venus now draws millions per annum. Let's go back now to those two million tourists who endure long lines, high ticket prices, and crowded galleries just to catch a glimpse of Botticelli's Venus. What brings them there? What does the word Renaissance mean to them, to us today? One of the greatest unsolved mysteries of the Renaissance will help us answer this question. Two, Botticelli and Dante. We have much in Botticelli's hand. There are such masterpieces as the Primavera and Birth of Venus, as well as less known but equally arresting paintings like the Cestello Annunciation. If you decide you want to see all of Botticelli's paintings, I recommend getting some good traveler's insurance. There are works in Ajaccio and Amsterdam, Baltimore and Basel, Cambridge, Mass, and Cambridge, England, Detroit and Dresden. Almost every single letter of the alphabet is accounted for. Florence alone has 50 works by him of some in that range. That made him really the opposite of an artist who didn't think much of him, Leonardo, right? Um, Leonardo only finished about 20 paintings, period. They were polar opposites in many ways. Leonardo was a scientist and a perfectionist for whom the artwork was all about that process of discovery. Once it started being work, that is, the means to some cash payment, he tended to lose interest. Once it stopped being a clue to the inner workings of nature, it stopped being of interest. Botticelli, on the other hand, was an awesome businessman. I've spent the last six months researching his Bottega, and it was thriving. It was one of the most uh, lucrative in, in all of Florence for a few generations until the death of Lorenzo Magnifico, right? You could rely on him to deliver a commission. And he didn't use his paintings for exploring the natural world. He was more like Shakespeare. Everything he thought about the world was encoded in the surface of his paint, in a sense for sale, just as it was for Shakespeare. It was all in the surface of his words. He was no scholar, no scientist, solo pittore, just a painter. Except for one very unusual case. From sometime around 1480 until early 1490s, and some argue, falsely I think, all the way until his death in 1510, so at least 10 years, if not more. Botticelli began to keep something that functioned like Leonardo's notebooks and Michelangelo's poetry. Two other secret activities hidden from the public's eye and conduits for private thoughts and intimate desires. Botticelli began to obsessively illustrate Dante's Commedia, all 100 cantos of this massive epic poem. I hope to convince you today that these drawings represent Botticelli's most personal and guarded diary. They're a visual record expressed in the form of drawings and through the medium of which he was the acclaimed master, the line. We could even argue that with Botticelli, drawing goes from being something preparatory and to, as it was considered principally back then, into being a sort of finished work in and of itself. The line of Botticelli is like the note in Mozart, something that dances lightly over surfaces and through time, our most direct connection to the genius mind that conceived it. No wonder that the only painting Botticelli ever signed, or actually one of the very few that he ever signed, was one of his illustrations of Dante. I'm not able to blow it up, unfortunately, but it, drawing of Paradiso 28, he wrote Sandro di Mariano. His father's name was Mariano. It's one of the very few instances we have of an actual signature by Botticelli. Because in fact, as one of his great, as, as a prominent art historian said, we know virtually nothing about him as a person, not even, not even his exact birth date. For the best bi biography on Botticelli, we have to go all the way back to Herbert Horn's magisterial Botticelli, painter of Florence, from 1907. Has anyone been to the Horn Museum in Florence? I highly recommend you go there. He was an amazing collector and an amazing craftsman. 
and he built a kind of kind of uh, a collection that's nothing like Berenson's at Villa Itati, but he sort of um, spent his life in Florence cataloging great works and writing this extremely detailed biography of Botticelli, but he considered the biography itself a work of art. It was, he was a fine um, draftsman, and he did it on certain paper, so it was extremely expensive. It's really one running chapter, so it's very hard to kind of read through, and he purposely left out any biographical references. He didn't believe in that. He wanted only to address the artwork. So that's still a work of record in thinking about Botticelli. There's no statement or prose in his hand. So where do we get our image of him? Well, this is where things get interesting. Most of why Botticelli fell into oblivion was because of Vasari. In Vasari's Lives of the Great Artist, he dedicates, it's the ultimate damning with faint praise. He gives them a, several pages, almost grudgingly, and says some very mean things about his biography of Dante, which we'll get to. Okay. Um, before I do that, I'd like us to speculate for a minute. You, many of you have heard of Botticelli. Many of you have heard on, of Dante. You know, all, everyone's heard of Dante in this room, I'm, I presume. Why was Botticelli so drawn to him? It's not as obvious as you think. Botticelli was unlettered. He, he didn't have the education of the more aristocratic Michelangelo. Vasari believed he was completely ill-equipped to illustrate um, Dante, that he didn't have the scholarly chops, right? Um, what brought this pagan Renaissance poet into the orbit of this Christian medieval poet? You know, I have to say, part of my entry into this point is, I think the Florentine connection is enormous. Uh, this project was conceived in Florence. Most of the work was done in Florence, walking through the streets they walked through. Um, they both loved Florence viscerally and either lost it, Dante, or faced the threat of losing it, Botticelli, especially after the death of Lorenzo. They both witnessed death, a lot of death, in the people they loved, especially in the young. Dante's muse Beatrice dead at 24, roughly the same age as Botticelli's muse Simonetta and his patron Giuliano dei Medici. More important, they both mourn these deaths in public. Dante wrote the Vita Nuova in, in the Commedia as a testament to Beatrice, and Botticelli ominously was commissioned to paint the executed effigies of the men who had slaughtered Giuliano during the Pazzi conspiracy of 1478. So there is this personal connection. What do the scholars have to say about this? For all the scholarship on Botticelli and Dante, one major area has been overlooked. How the Dante drawings help explain why Botticelli faded from view after his death in 1510. In fact, the disappearance of Botticelli's Dante project, the drawings were lost at his death. They disappeared for a set of couple hundred years. I'll get to that. What happened to Botticelli was Vasari wrote this extremely um, passive aggressive chapter on him. He said, um, he wrote, you know, Dante, um, this is your first quote, okay? So you take a look at that first quote. I, I, I passed out some quotes here. Per essere persona sofistica, Botticelli commentò, that means uh, illustrated, una parte di Dante e figurò lo inferno e lo mise in stampa, dietro al quale consumò di molto tempo, per il che non lavorando fu cagione di infiniti disordini alla vita sua. So you hear the, the, the disdain, right? To show that he was of a sophisticated mind, right? This poor unlettered Botticelli. He il it shouldn't be common. That's a mistranslation in the Penguin edition. It should be Botticelli illustrated a part of Dante. He illustrated the Inferno and had it printed, a task that consumed much of his time and kept him from his work, and thus was the cause of infinite disorder in his life. So it's categorical, right? This was a waste of his time. On the one hand, he does have a point, Vasari. These Dante drawings were not primavera. They were not, you know, the great mythological paintings of the 1480s. Certainly not the work that made him famous. But he, he does disservice to what I think is one of the great epic artistic works of the Rinascimento, these 100 drawings. But uh, Vasari never saw all of them. He saw just a collection of them, probably, you know, um, 
they, because the, the 100 disappeared um, when Botticelli died. So he's actually basing his assessment on incorrect knowledge. Why is he saying that? Vasari described Botticelli as someone who, quote, easily mastered all that he wanted to, but someone, quote, who refused to settle down or be satisfied with reading, writing, and arithmetic. In short, he had a restless mind, which squares with Vasari's later image of him as one who, quote, finally, as an old man, Sandro found himself so poor that if Lorenzo de Medici and his friends and other worthy men who loved him for his talent had not come to his assistant, he would have died of hunger, end quote. As with most of Azari, that's a half-truth. Lorenzo dies in 1494. Botticelli's still a famous painter then. He's just finished his Dante volume. He's not poor yet. <laughs> but he really does become poor from about 1500 to 1510 and has all sorts of you know, health ailments as well. What Vasari's really digging into him for is he was convinced that Botticelli became a follower of Savonarola. And Vasari despised him, despised the anti-Medici you know, anti, uh, platform of Savonarola, despised the asceticism and the bonfires of the vanities, and he thought that you know, Botticelli had become a piagnone, a weeper, a follower of Savonarola. There's no conclusive evidence that this actually happened. It's clear that Savonarola did influence Botticelli's last paintings, that he imbibed this atmosphere of spiritual reform in, uh, in Florence of the 1490s, but again, it's, it's a stretch. Um, so what, what is the truth? You know, Michelangelo has this wonderful quote about um, Vasari. He said, you bring back to life those who have passed away, extend the lives of the living, and full of wrath, assign the incompetent to eternal death." <laughs> Unquote. So let's see now, let's circle back 500 years and see what was true in what Vasari said, what was a lie, what was sheer wrath, and what was legitimate art history. Which brings us to part three of my talk, discovering Botticelli's Dante, discovering the Renaissance. Okay? Um, so we have here Vasari calling it Cagione di infiniti disordini, the cause of infinite disorder. All right, so then was he a follower of Savonarola? Was he a piagnone, right? Was he a weeper of, of the so-called mad monk of Ferrara? Let's, let's find this out through the discovery of the Dante drawings. So they disappear after 1510. No one knows where they go, right? There's a notice of them in 1689. Seven of them showed up in Rome and Queen, uh, the Queen of Sweden, Queen Christina's collection, including the most famous one, the Mappa, right, that you often see. I think that was used to publicize my talk. Um, but the other ones, we're not so sure where they went. That's a lot of them. That's 93. <laughs> they could have been given as a gift by uh, Lo Botticelli's painting, Lorenzo di Pierfrancesco, to Charles VIII when he invaded France, or invaded Florence from France. Again, we speculate. They, they seem to have wound up in France. They did end up in a bookseller there in the 1700s. And then people sense, they kind of low, you know, if you look at the GPS, the Google Maps, they seem to be in this collection in Scotland of this royal, you know, this noble family, um, the Duke of Alexander, right? But still no one was sure. Let's see how we finally figured it out. This is your second quote. This is from the guy who made the uh, sort of, it's not that he discovered them per se, but he was one of the first to really say all those 85 drawings in this Scottish collection are by Botticelli. Picture a parchment manuscript in large folio format with one page of Dante's text followed by another page in breathlessly italicized words covered in its entirety with pen and silver point drawings by Botticelli. Friedrich Littmann, letter to the German government, 1882. That's your second quote. Where is that coming from? With these breathlessly italicized words covered in its entirety, Friedrich Littmann announced what is arguably the greatest artistic discovery of the 19th century and certainly one of the key moments in our modern understanding of the term Renaissance. These words appeared that Littmann wrote in a June 9, 1882 letter in his capacity as director of the Kufustik cabinet, the print collection of the newly formed Royal Museum of Berlin. 
Lippmann was writing his boss about a cache of drawings that he had just come across at Ellison White Booksellers in London, where they were about to go on auction at Sotheby's, right? He had come to sort of settle a, a, a lingering doubt about who actually was the author of these drawings. And they were part of this um, collection called Hamilton. This is his uh, German, Ganze Zeit der Beckland von Botticelli, right? This is one of the, um, this is Inferno uh, 15, I think, uh, Botticelli. One of the few colored drawings that we have. Only about four or five of them have color. The 93 extra drawings are mostly in, um, in uh, sketch. And this was the lot, this Hamilton MS-207, an auction lot. This is one of the other works in the, in the collection, the first Commedia ever on British soil. So there were other works, but Lippmann was really just interested in the Botticelli drawings. So what did, what did he do? Why did he sense that these were by Botticelli and no one else? First, let's talk a little bit about Lippmann. He's a fascinating character. I like to think of him as like Joseph Conrad's character, Kurtz, in The Heart of Darkness. All of Europe had contributed to his making, you know, as Conrad writes. He was born in 1838 in German-speaking Prague in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, traveled often to Italy as a child, and spent chunks of his gilded youth in Paris and London. So he's a completely European person of letters, of culture, right? Um, his was the life of the cultured elite, and he was making a name for himself as one of the shrewdest arbiters of aesthetic and artistic value in all of Europe. If all of Europe had contributed to the making of Lippmann, then centuries of inbreeding, idleness, and heredity sloth had conspired to produce the man standing between him and Hamilton MS-207, the manuscript containing Botticelli's drawings. The 12th Duke of Hamilton and owner of these Botticelli's drawings was one of those figures that only privilege and peerage can produce. Born to an illustrious family in Scotland, young William Alexander, drank and boxed his way through Oxford, hunted five days a week, and amassed such staggering gambling debts that the family literally had to auction off the, the jewels. And the greatest jewel that they had was this contested edition of the Divine Comet. Not this one, that's in the, the Rome edition, but um, you know the, the drawings that um, you see in, um, that I showed you earlier. The folio that Lippmann described in his letter to Shona contained 85 drawings by Botticelli, and was part of his plan to illustrate the entire 100 cantos of the Divine Comedy. Botticelli had begun the drawings in the early 1480s, most likely in conjunction with a famous edition that was published at that time, the Landino edition of the Divine Comedy, which was a celebratory work that Florence commissioned. Botticelli produced drawings that were eventually made into wood engravings for it. Um, but around the same time, he seemed to have been conditioned to produce a deluxe you know, volume of all 100 of the Commedia by Lorenzo di Pier Francesco, who was a cousin and rival of Lorenzo dei Medici. And so he spent 10 years doing this, basically. Partly in his spare time, he was doing other drawings as well. Um, and then no one was sure, you know, who, to whom the drawings belong. I've gotten ahead of myself a little bit. Um, let's go back a bit here. So this, this is the, the very famous map, right? Many of you, have, have some of you have seen this before, the map of Dante's Hell. This is the only completed drawing in the whole set. Uh, all the other ones are impartial, right? Um, so why couldn't people be certain that the other 85, or 92 rather, were by Botticelli? We have to go back in time a little bit to understand this. The situation is not as plausible as you think. In the first place, it wasn't just Botticelli's Dante that had faded into obscurity. It was Botticelli himself. After his heyday as the most gifted and sought-after Florentine artist in the 15th century, scant mention is made of Botticelli in subsequent centuries, and he never achieved the legendary status of old masters with whom he is now grouped, the Giottos and the Raphaels, right? Among many factors related to Botticelli's eclipse, the first has, what we, it has to do with what we might call late style. That's a term that Edward Said and Adorno have used. You know, this idea of the end of your career not resolving the issues that you set out in the beginning of your career, right? Um, after the de deaths of his illustrious Medici paintings, Botticelli seemed to have struggled in the late stage of his career. Perhaps he was under the sway of Savonarola. He certainly was 
infusing his paintings, I'll show you uh, some of them, I believe, that have Savonarola elements. Um, and the Dante drawings kind of mark this transition from his heyday as the author of, you know, drawings like, I mean, paintings like this. This is when Botticelli was establishing himself as one of Florence's most coveted artists. This is his Adoration of the Magi from 1475, right? So he's 30 years old. The Medici take him, and he basically makes the Medici. You see the Lorenzo and Giuliano here. You see various other members of the family. He basically makes his Medici patrons into modern-day Magi. <laughs> and uh, where is he in this wonderful act of branding? right in the corner. So his work is hanging in the most public places in Florence. His bottega is the most coveted, probably, in all of Florence. He's famous. He's riding high. Things start to change, though. Um, when he paints, in 1478, during the Pazzi conspiracy, he, um, he's asked by the, the Florentine government to paint the hanged effigies of the Pazzi conspirators. And it's posted on the Bargello, you know, like the most public real estate in all of Florence. It's one thing to be the favorite painter of the Medici, it's another thing to be their propagandist. And so they had many enemies, the Medici, and Lorenzo kind of went into damage control in the aftermath of the Pazzi conspiracy, and as a goodwill gesture, he sent Botticelli to Rome to paint the Sistine Chapel. You may not know this, but he was you know, did, did the Sistine Chapel before Michelangelo. It's a perfectly fine, wonderful work. It's not Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. It's the only time he spent outside of Rome, uh, outside of Florence. And when he comes back to Florence, his career starts to change a little bit. Um, this is when he starts the Dante drawings. Um, what happened to Botticelli? What, what did this Dante project lead him to? Um, if we look at this, this next slide here, let me turn this yellow thing off. We see that the, uh, the Dante drawings were never like this, right? They were more private. They were privately conditioned volume. No one had seen them in public. So as late as 1854, this is a distinguished German art historian, Karl von Wagen. He says, and I think this is your, um, did I put that quote on your paper? No, but I, I can tell you what he wrote. He says, this, uh, the, he, know, he looked at the Hamilton manuscripts of Botticelli and he said, there's a Divina Commedia of large folio in the second half of the 15th century containing indubitably the richest illustrations of this great poem. But listen to what he says. Various hands of various artistic skill are discernible. That of Sandro Botticelli is very obvious. He is known to have studied Dante. But notice he doesn't say they were all done by Botticelli. Do you see how there's still lingering doubt if this work is actually by Botticelli or not? Even an expert like him could get it wrong. Why? Again, we have to go back in time. Imagine all these Renaissance works of unknown provenance, right? You didn't have infrared, <laughs> like laser back then. You depended on the eye, the connoisseur. When I got interest in this project, I was in a house that connoisseur built, connoisseurship built, Villa Itati. That was built by Bernard Berenson. You could get very rich identifying, authenticating works for your patrons, right? Berenson was one. Horn was another person that could identify the authenticity just based on their encyclopedic knowledge of art history, just based on their but did they have a conflict of interest, right? Because they knew if you authenticated the work, you could get paid handsomely for it. That's an open question. Lippmann is one of these connoisseurs. So he's the one that has to kind of extrapolate out of these Botticelli drawings the consistency that makes them all in one hand, right? So this, this is very much in its infancy at the time. Lippmann knew immediately, though, when he saw the drawings, he says, look at the... Look at the face, look at the, even the lips, look at the melancholy expression, look at the consistency. These are all in one hand. And he did something quite radical. He convinced the German government to spend the equivalent of about $20 million to buy the whole auction lot, not just the drawing. That sounds like nothing today, right? You know, da Vinci, Leonardo's, Leonardo sells for $500 million, right? Or a contested work by Leonardo. 
But back then, this was a lot of money to invest in a work of art. Not everyone was happy about it. The um, uh, Princess Victoria, who's actually married to the German crown, says this is an offense to national sensibilities to let these paintings leave England. Shows you whose side she's on. <laughs> her husband's or her, her country's, right? She wanted the, the paintings in England. There was a national outcry. Um, to this day, you know, this, this, this sense of the, the paintings, A, the drawings of Dante having left Italy first, and then England, right? Um, so how did this happen? How was Lippmann able to see something that no one else did or maybe have the conviction that few other people did? What are these drawings? I think now we should move to a reading of the drawings themselves so we can really get inside them. So part four of our paper is the drawings, a reading. What, what was Botticelli doing? Any modern interpretation of Botticelli's drawings must begin with the two men more than anyone else responsible for their rehabilitation. And these are also the two men who we owe a great deal to our understanding of the Renaissance of. Walter Pater and John Ruskin were writing seminal works on the Renaissance and Botticelli at the same time. Let's see how they go hand in hand. This is your um, third quote. I think it's one of the smartest things anyone ever said about the, the drawings. Botticelli's name, little known in the last century, is quietly becoming important. What is the peculiar sensation? What is the peculiar quality of pleasure which his work has the pr property of exciting in us and which we cannot get elsewhere? Botticelli is far from accepting the conventional orthodoxy of Dante, which referring all human action to the easy formula of purgatory, heaven, and hell. Doesn't think much of Dante's <laughs> contrapasso. Um, Botticelli instead accepts that middle world in which men take no side in great conflict and make great refusals. What's strange about that? Those are exactly the people Dante can't stand, right? The, when he says Virgil, like when he sees the neutrals, he says, don't even look at them. They're not worth a second look. And here we have Walter Pater celebrating that middle world of Botticelli. What's happening here? Why would he celebrate that same thing that Dante seems to despise? And you know, if you look at it, this is also what Ruskin said about Botticelli. He said, Botticelli, Ruskin's on the left here, on the right, uh, yeah, my right. Uh, Botticelli is betwixt Christian and heathen, right? So middle ground, betwixt Christian and heathen. Uh, this is where I started to see that Botticelli was no mere illustrator of Dante. He had a reading, and this is what I want to say. Teaching film, the most interesting adaptations are strong readings of the original, right? Not just mimicking it blindly, but really developing an interpretation. I came to see that Botticelli really had a reading of Dante. What is that reading? This wanting it both ways, wanting a Botticelli with access to Dante's spiritual realm, but also anchored on, on planet Earth, again, joins Ruskin and Pater in their reading. Now there's a third person who's so essential here in addition to uh, Ruskin and Pater, and that's Berenson. Bernard Berenson, uh, the founder of Villa Itati. He was one of the people who was going up and down Italy, cataloging the works of art, and devoting a lot of time to Botticelli. He was one of the people who puts Botticelli on the map, along with Berenson, along with Ruskin and Pater. And what uh, Berenson said is interesting. He actually, um, you know, when you see something, a, paint, a painting like this, it's very easy to sort of see why they would see that balance between paganism and Christianity, right? We talked about this sort of joyous dance within the context of the um, Annunciation theme. But Berenson is not convinced by uh, Botticelli's Dante. He actually says they're not at all Dantesque. He says that, you know, he's like, look, they're beautiful. It's by Botticelli. He drew very well. He called them um, rhapsodies of pure line. So you know, you, you, it's sort of the jury's out on this project. On the one hand, there's a kind of rehabilitation of, of Botticelli at work in the 19th century as the Renaissance is being theorized and conceptualized. On the other hand, there's the kind of lingering shadow of Vasari, this not being convinced by the Dante project, this sense that the drawings were not only incomplete, but perhaps a failure and it, rightly that they had faded into obscurity. 
let's, let's take that on. Do the drawings succeed? Do they fail? Do they take us inside Dante? Or are they just a, 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 a very interesting Dan Brown-like episode of art historical uh, mystery? Let, let's see what we can make of that. I call this section diseño, adapting verse to line, because I do think the drawings are not illustrations, not drawings as such. I think they're an adaptation. I think Botticelli takes the poem and creates something new. The way a filmmaker takes a book, you know, Bicycle Thieves is a, not a great book, but it's a great movie, right? The Leopard is a great book and a great movie, right? So this is, I think, what Botticelli's doing. He's adapting, and it's a kind of proto-cinematic work if you think about it, because he, he actually gives the, the drawings movement. There's 100 of them, and you can read them as a kind of, you know, uh, in, a, in almost an animated faction. So what is he doing here? What is this um, adapting verse to line? Remember what Vasari said about disegno, right? Perché this is your sixth quote. This is what makes the Florentine the greatest artist, right? They're masters of drawing, masters of line, uh, as opposed to the Venetians, those colorists, right? They, you know, they don't really understand the foundation of all art is the ability to create that, ver that visual map, that contoured architectonic line that gives you the structure of something, that's, that's the genius of Florentine Renaissance art. As Vasari says, Perché il disegno padre delle tre arti nostre, architettura, scultura, pittura, etc., right? Proceeds from the intellect, takes out of many things a universal judgment, similar to a form or an idea that we find in nature, okay? So it's, it's a kind of, um, I think disegno is where you have to begin your interpretation of these Dante drawings, right? Following, in other words, we're going to actually use Vasari to argue against his own critique of the, of the drawings. So if we look at the drawings of hell, what do we see? Look at Dante's Selva Oscura. Gosh, isn't that so different from what we've always seen, the Doré, the pilgrim in a dark wood, you know? Um, what do you see here? It's, it's, it's completely different, right, than the other representations of the Selva Oscura. Um, is it like this Selva Oscura? I think that's a stretch, okay? Um, but one thing is clear, right? Um, we see what Botticelli's doing in the Dante drawings is trying to create a kind of map in Inferno, okay? So we see... This is the kind of motif in all his paintings, in all his drawings. You see the, uh, the pilgrim here, right? He's reproducing the movement of the pilgrim. We don't get the personaggi. We don't get the characters. That's why we love Inferno. Give us Paolo and Francesca. Give us Ugolino. You don't get any of that in uh, Botticelli's Dante drawings. Why? Why does the figure disappear? Okay? What do we get instead? I think what we get instead, and it's not either landscape, really. Okay? Landscape. This is a landscape. This is Leonardo, a Tuscan countryside. Leonardo could do landscape. <laughs> right? He thought Botticelli was a terrible landscaper. I think, wasn't his comment something like throwing a sponge against a wall, as indiscreet as that, and the lines would run down? You know? And let's face it, you know, Botticelli's not going to win any awards for his... Um, Absolutely competent, but um, you know, not Leonardo-like level of detail. But look at what else we get in Botticelli. Look at this is another drawing of. I think this is the um, the wood. You know, let's look at Botticelli's wood of suicides. Okay, this is one of the most famous canto in all of Dante. When Dante meets Pier de Le Vigne, right? Pier de Le Vigne, who's um, trapped in a tree, a vegetable of sorts. And Dante really relates to Pierre because Pierre, like Dante, was a poet, politician. Dante is rumored to have contemplated suicide those first years. We'll never know, but we know he was in the depths of despair after his exile. And he continued to lament the loss of Florence in his poetry. And we know he identified with um, Pierre in some, some profound way. But where is Pierre? <laughs> he's, he's lost. We don't see him at all, right? That's not what we get in Doré. Look at Doré's Pierre, right? It's so graphically present. That's an illustration, right? This is an adaptation, right? Illustration, you got it. There he is, okay? Even Blake, the great Blake, right? Look at his. Uh, you know, the figure is front and center. Or even an even more moving 
canto, the encounter with Dante's teacher, Brunetto, right? Where's Se Brunetto, right? Where is he? This is Inferno 15. I guess you can see him tugging at the hem of Dante, but there's no visual space given to him, no, no highlighting of this person with whom he has this extraordinary you know, uh, colloquial, <laughs> this interview on the run where he says, I remember my treasure so that I can live on. And he's lecturing him even in hell, right? Read my book, right? Um, where is he? They're gone from the Botticelli drawing. There's only one portrait in all of Inferno, and you're not going to believe who it is. <coughs> Satan. Now, if there's one thing we can all agree on, Dante Satan ain't Milton Satan, right? He's not this sort of charming, uh, you know, dynamic figure. He's this machine, like he's devouring the sinners. Dante purposely makes him this, this uh, you know, enormous, almost bestial piece of matter, right? But here, Botticelli actually draws him in depth. Um, it's the only real portrait we have in the, um, in the Inferno. What is happening? I think what he's trying to do, in a sense, Botticelli is being literal in Inferno. He's giving you the map. He's giving you the terrain. He's not getting into the people. I have a hunch as to why that I'm going to tell you later. Uh, I think it has to do with his ambivalence about Dante's contrapasso. Okay, but I'm going to develop that in a bit. For now, let's just leave it and say that he is more concerned with mapping hell, right, giving us the, the kind of structure of it, and less so with giving us these great characters, right? Um, the, the thing that can, inspired Auerbach to call Dante a realist that inspired, I think, Francesco De Santi said, you know, how can you read Inferno 5 and not fall in love with Francesca da Rimini, right? Um, so what, what does he do? What is Botticelli's genius in this translation? I think this really starts to become clear when we get into purgatory, when we get into what we, I would call Botticelli's visual poetics, right? This is part two of our reading. Botticelli gets something in Dante. Look at these two quotes seven and eight. They're very famous quotes. One is from Inferno 32, right? It's that famous line, si o avessi le rime aspre chioce come si converrebbe al tristo buco. If I had the harsh and grating rhymes as would befit the dismal, this dismal hall. You can almost hear that hiss of the subjunctive, right? Dante's trying to find a language to match the, the grittiness, the, um, the horror, if you will, of Inferno, right? And then look at everything changes the atmosphere in Purgatory 1. Ma qui, la morta poesie, this is eight quote, quote eight. La morta poesie risurga, dolce color d'oriental zaffiro che si accol accoglieva nel ser sereno aspetto del mezzo, puro in fino al primo giro. Right? May this poem rise again from hell's dead realm. Right? He says, brought back my joy in seeing just as soon as I had left behind the air of death that afflicted both my sight and breast. What is, how do you capture that? You know, a genius taking on another genius is what we have here. He's not going to literalize the poem. He's going to make some decisions. So Botticelli's decision is, I've already made my decision in hell. I'm not going to show you the characters, I'm going to give you the structure, the terrain. In purgatory, I'm going to give you the atmosphere. I'm going to give you the visual poetics by changing everything. Notice how the drawings all change. Where's the detail, right? These are from, this is from purgatory. Notice the figure starting to come back, right? Um, Where's the, um, where's that emphasis on structure from hell? What are we getting in? Notice the atmosphere here is lighter, just like the poetry. Notice it's kind of, you can almost imagine those lines, right, uh, from Purgatory. Ma qui la morta poesia resurga. Dead poetry is rising and it's being visualized here, right? We still have disegno, it's still in its own way schematic. But look what's replaced the map. 
Dante and Beatrice, these two figures in this kind of joyous dance among the penitential souls. Um, you know, this is, kind of, and we even have more detailed ones. If you go into Purgatory 10, the famous uh, canto where Dante sees the fine arts. This is an example here of what, you know, Baxendall called the period eye. This is a famous painting from the Renaissance, the Battle of San Romano, right? Okay? And Dante, Dante, Botticelli, this is as Ill illustrative as Purgatory gets. Otherwise, he tends to make certain decisions, okay? So we get the period eye uh, through this, this dialogue between this uh, Battle of San Romano and this painting here. But otherwise, Dante's focus seems to be on something else. What is it? Let's go back to that quote by Pater, that middle world. This third section I call that middle world or unredeemed beauty. Unredeemed beauty. Um, what is he doing with these? Not incidentally, one scholar located Dante in between, uh, Alessandro Paronchi, a very interesting art historian uh, from earlier generations, said, you know, to really understand Dante, you also have to read Petrarch, that there, there's a, he's, he's sort of um, a, going in between them. As they, his paintings exhibit both the earthly grace of Petrarch's pagan culture and the intense kind of more spiritual energies of Dante's world, a hybridity embodied here uh, that we saw in the, uh, the Cestello Annunciation. I hear these words, and I cannot help but think of Pater's emphasis on Dante's middle ground. I'm not convinced Dante's mediating between Dante and Petrarch, but I do think there is a kind of mediation going on between heaven and earth. In Ruskin's wor words on Dante's harmony between the Christian and the pagan, we start to see, um, we start to see some real striking similarities between the pagan and divine in Botticelli. As, for instance, his Venus rem resembles Beatrice, right? If you see the, the, the birth of Venus here, you see Beatrice in Paradiso. And his earthly paradise in Primavera resembles his earthly paradise in Purgatorio. Here's the earthly paradise in Purgatorio, and one of the most beautiful Dante illustrations is Upper Purgatory, right? The, uh, the earthly paradise. So you're starting to see, remember, these were all done at the same time. <laughs> these were all done in the 1480s. So there's a real kind of dialogue going on between the famous paintings and the drawings. Indeed, the higher we ascend, the more the figure is reclaimed and the more the poem can seem to recede from view. I actually think Inferno is more accurate as an illustration. You get more detail of Dante's poem you start to get much more selective when we get to Purgatory and Paradiso, right? And there's some utterly distinct Botticellian anomalies. One, where suddenly the figure has been reclaimed. This is one of his Paradiso drawings. Notice this, almost the, the emphasis on just Dante and Beatrice to the exclusion of all else. But where's the poem, right? The figures are back. But remember in Inferno how detailed the illustrations were? Where'd the poem go? Here's some anomalies. By the way, just because I think they're better than Inferno. The anomalies don't make them worse. I think it becomes more of a reading. There's no portraits in Botticelli's Inferno. The realm of per eccellenza personaggi, right? In Italian when someone says, ma che personaggio? You know, that's, that's, that's uh, what a character, right? Dante and Beatrice up close in Paradiso but that's also the canticle of transhumana, right? Self-transcendence. And yet we're emphasizing the, the bodily figure, almost the dance of these figures, just in like the Chastel Annunciation. It's a consistently secular, even pagan visual idiom throughout the pilgrim's ascent to Purgatory and Paradiso. And most important, there's an occlusion of the narrative line as we ascend. Why? Here's my take on this thing, and this is the last section, and then I open it up for questions, okay? I think what's at work is Botticelli's struggle with contrapasso, what I call medieval pain, humanist ambivalence, right? We know well that hell is predicated on a system of crime and punishment through what, you know, John Frachero's written so beautifully on this, dead metaphors, right? These, these, 
almost reified figures of speech, right? You see that famous quote from Bertrand de Born uh, in uh, Dante Inferno 28. Perchio parti così giunte persone, partito porto il mio cerebro lasso, right? Because I severed those so joined, I carry, alas, my brain dissevered from its source, which is women. So, and so we see in me the counter penalty, right? Così si osserva in me lo contrapasso. What did contrapasso mean to someone like Botticelli? I think to really understand this, we have to leave Dante and go to Boccaccio, another author who Botticelli illustrated. And I want to take you in particular to a story that he illustrated right around the time he was doing his Dante drawings in the 1480s. He's commissioned, I believe it's by his uh, wealthy patron family, the Vespucci, to do uh, a wedding, a wedding drawing, right? A wedding painting. He accepts the commission. Botticelli will always accept a commission. Um, and uh, what does he do? Let's, let's take a look. He does a, a commission of the short story of Nastagio degli Onesti. Right? Do you know that story? It's such a strange story. It's the story of this nobleman in Ravenna, Nastagio, who loves this woman, and she has the nerve to not want to marry him. And so he's really, a, you know, he's incensed. So he goes off into the wood, like the dark wood, in this brooding fit. And each, he comes across this strange prodigy. He sees a knight on horseback, who's a ghost, charging through the wood after a naked woman. And he slaughters the woman. And then his dogs attack her. And not just slaughters her, he rips out the entrails. He exacts his revenge. And this is repeated every week. And Nastaccio, as a true Boccaccio figure, somehow finds a way to gain personally from this, this horror show, right, of this this awful, you know, misogynistic, terrible, violent scene. He says, you know what? I'm going to invite both families to this very spot and let that callous woman who's refused my passes see what can happen to women like this, right? I mean, it's a crazy story. We, we cringe at it now. But what's even more cringeworthy is the way Boccaccio reacts to it, and I'll read you that. So, um... So what happens? Look at how Botticelli paints this painting, right? So um, we, we get the, the bride, okay? This is, this is the, the dogs literally chasing this woman. There's the knight on horseback, okay? All right, so three of the four panels are devoted, I believe, to this scene of graphic violence, okay? Here's another scene. It's so very similar to the Dante drawings where Dante almost, uh, Botticelli almost animates Dante's movement. Here he's animating this, this grisly quest. Notice the, the, the kind of the visual rhetoric here. The woman is naked, completely defenseless. So not only is it horrifying, cruel, and tragic, it's cowardly, right? He's, he's pursuing this naked woman on horseback with his animals. And look at the vengeance. It's, his face is livid, you see? there in the front. Um, he's not just killing her, he's torturing her, right? And lo and behold, they all come to the banquet <laughs> and witness <laughs> the scene in the midst of their gluttony, okay? Um, so what's going on here? What's going on if we look at this scene? I think that this scene, um, we know Dante's obsession with contrapasso from the winds of passion buffeting Paolo and Francesca to the severed head of Bertrand de Born, right? I believe this horrified Botticelli, a humanist who could no longer accept the spiritual certainties of Dante's medieval world, whether because of his temperament or his worldview. Hence that middle, non-committal stance. Remember Pater? That Botticelli's in between, right? Ruskin, the same thing, Right? Um, if we look closely at Botticelli's rendition of, of Nastagio, we can see why he was reticent about giving the contrapasso in hell its full glory. Okay? In Botticelli, we get a grisly and emphatic repetition of the contrapasso in three panels that underscore the cruelty of an innocent naked girl's fate in the face of a massively armed male consort and its ferocious animals. 
in the final image of the panel, this is the one that's the really the worst. Okay, you've just seen the, the, the slaughter, okay, right? Look at the reaction here. Brindisi. <laughs> Everyone raises a glass. Look, I mean, talk about phallic architecture, right? I mean, look at these arches, this, this, this reinforced patriarchal system that this girl is hemmed in by, dominated by. The two families decide to hold the marriage after seeing that grisly scene. This is, you know, you know, in a way more grisly than the 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 scenes with a dog chasing the the the, the innocent victim. Um, I think this says so much. In the final image of the panel, the social order is in force, and all are free to glut themselves with wine and drink and celebrate the nuptials. Its monumental architecture and symmetry emphasize how inexorable was the male-dominated system of mores and protocols that saw to the young woman's punishment. I can sense Botticelli squirming with the Dante's Contrapasso because his work, his art, just does not demonstrate that level of investment in Dante's doctrine. I just don't see the level of belief. Um, now again, that's a kind of speculation that I'm working out in my research, but I think the visual record does show that this level of Contrapasso through what Botticelli emphasizes is more a, a kind of affront than an, an, an instance of justice. Um, and why is that so astonishing? Look at, what look at what Boccaccio has to say about this. This is quote 10. In the interest of time, I'll just read the English. The damsel, this is the one who, Nostagio, who refused to marry Nostagio. The damsel, who now knew that she herself was to blame that she was not already Nostagio's wife, made answer that she agreed to Nostagio's wedding proposal. Wherefore, by her own mouth, she acquainted her father and her mother that she agreed to marry him, and they heartily approved her choice. Nastagio wedded her on the ensuing Sunday and lived happily with her many a year. Nor was it her instance alone that this terror was productive of good. This terror was productive of good. On the contrary, it so wrought among the ladies of Ravenna that they all became and have ever been since much more compliant with men's desires than they had been before. <laughs> so no more playing hard to get, right? You know, the, 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 this, this gruesome lesson here that Boccaccio seems to say the women of Ravenna learn, it's an amazing quote. It's so, you know, so, um, so uh, disconsonant with what anyone today would think about, you know, um, women's rights. Now, we see as we read this that, you know, I think Botticelli himself bristled at it. Why do I call this last section unredeemed beauty? I'll bring in a modern thinker, and this is just a kind of thought I'm following. And I'd like to close my talk on an open point. Um, if we look closely at the words, um, you know, Botticelli's Contrapasso, it really inhabits that middle ground, right, that Pater and Ruskin described. It's so horrible, I think, because in Botticelli, he doesn't have Dante's certainty that suffering will be redeemed, right? Um, he's, he's betwixt and between those old certainties of that cataclysmic order, spiritual order, where hell had its purpose, purgatory had its purpose, paradiso. They seem to be gone for Botticelli. It brings in mind to me a quote from Nietzsche on unredeemed beauty, which is your last quote. Nietzsche, after he wrote of the death of God, wrote this text, you know, The Genealogy of Morals, where he talked about as much as he despised Christianity and Judaism for, you know, uh, in, instilling what he believed um, weakness in the modern mind, and he wanted people to create their own moral systems, predicated more on ancient protocols than on modern religious ones. Nietzsche, though, did understand something about Christianity. When he said God was dead, of course, he wasn't saying God literally died. He said it's just ceased to be a living presence in people's lives. And I think is what he's saying about the loss of redemption. Even if you suffered in Dante's hell, the suffering was for a reason. It upheld a view of the universe as run on systems of justice, law and order and God's love. What happens when that disappears? Nietzsche wrote, again, with 
you know, unfortunate misogynistic intent. Um, but if you look past the surface of the words, what he's saying about the modern condition in general is this. He says, I do not doubt that in comparison with one night of pain endured by a hysterical blue stocking, uh, that's a very educated woman. What Nietzsche is saying essentially is, you know, what the educated person goes through, the non-believer, is bad, even though it happens in the mind. The total suffering of all animals who have been subjected to the knife of scientific research is nothing. It's an extravagant quote, but what is he saying? It's clear that Nietzsche is asking us to think about what it means to suffer and about what it means to be in hell. As much as he despised Christianity, Nietzsche admitted that religion worked because it made suffering about something, part of a higher purpose. If you burned in hell, you did so because you had lived a life of sin. The flames may cause pain, but they also brought purification. With the idea of a living God and his code of values disappears, suffering becomes pointless. At least the animals he mentions died in the name of scientific research. Nietzsche's blue stocking, in contrast, suffers for no purpose, higher purpose. Her pains are meaningless and thus worse than any, any punishment hell could come up with. Suffers for no higher purpose. I think this is why Botticelli was, if we don't want to say turned off by Dante's Contrapasso, at least confused by it. It gave him pause and why he visualized it so emphatically in his paintings of um, Boccaccio's drawing and why he chose to emphasize the joyous dance of Beatrice and Dante and Purgatory and, and Heaven. He did not know if human suffering could be redeemed. So I will end with these thoughts. Um, we talked about unredeemed suffering and Nietzsche as a key to reading Botticelli. What is what I believe this visual epic? And I believe the hundred drawings are an epic in visual form. One, they're an artistic summa of Botticelli's late style. They're the diary of his time as he transitioned out of Medici patronage and into a difficult late period of his career, which saw him no longer as one of Florence's most coveted artists, but really someone struggling to find his way in a Florence first of civil war, then dominated by Savonarola discord, and finally when he was just really a forgotten figure. Second, I see this as a visual diary. It's the record of his inner life that Botticelli himself never left behind in words. He did not write Petrarchan sonnets wholesale like Le uh, Michelangelo, nor did he design flying machines like Leonardo. But he had a book that was his private record keeping. And Dante was the canonical author for the artists of Florence's Bottega. They, was with it. they felt at home in him, even though he was high cultural. He was the antidote to the humanist culture of, of Petrarch and Boccaccio. He was the guy, as Petrarch says, Dante's for people of the taverns. Uh, these guys were of the taverns, a lot of them. And you know, for Botticelli, Dante becomes the go-to author, his diary. Third, we won't get into this, um, I've spent a perhaps too much of my life reading about Medici patronage and politics of Dante, but it really, this, this project does take you inside the machine of the Medici empire and also how the Medici essentially bankrolled the Renaissance to a certain degree. This will give you a real picture of that, um, that intricate interplay. Fourth, I think, as I said, this is not an illustration, it's not an independent drawing, it's an adaptation in the sense we have of that word today. Taking a written work and creating a new visual form out of it. And last, I would go back to Petrarch. Um, Petrarch talked about the leggiadretto velo, like covering things. It, it's kind of, you know, over the poetry. I think that's an allegory for Botticelli. I take you back to our first quote. Let dead springs rise again. We know so little about him. We, in a way, we're in a one-way conversation with someone who won't speak back because he wrote nothing. So we kind of have to put words into pictures, and that involves, that's an act of translation, of course, and uh, you know, um, and it, it can't be 
um, a technical act. It has to be an art. And I'll close with a story. There's a story that says Michelangelo's annotated version of the Divine Comedy was lost at sea in a shipwreck as his goods were transformed from one logic of Michelangelo's to another. We wish we had that, don't we? Uh, Michelangelo, who is obsessed with Dante, whose last judgment you know, um, is, is, is almost a quotation of so much of Dante. So we have lost Michelangelo's Dante, but thankfully we have Botticelli's Dante. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I know, you know, I, I appreciate you sitting through. I know the talk was on the longer side, but I, I wanted to kind of develop a full reading of it, and I appreciate your, um, your investment. And I'd love to hear, this is my favorite part of the talk, I'd love to hear from you um, any questions or observations uh, or even complaints. Yes. Yes. Um, hi. Um, this is a topic in the way you presented that really speaks to my own research into the kind of the relationship between the private and the public and the uh, left only a few letters behind begging for money. So it's very comparable. And what strikes me about your work and what interests me, because in another life I was a clinical social worker dealing with the issues of trauma, childhood trauma. So I have a very psychological orientation. This period of time in Botticelli's life was a period of great upset externally. And it, would, it seems to me, and especially it seems supported by you, that he was searching for something, you know, the interest in Savonarola, you know, the, the reestablishment of some order. And I think you make that point and, and maybe could even develop it more, and maybe you do in the book, but he's, he's really looking to get his bearings in some way. Let me, let me, that's a wonderful question. Let me take you back to a painting that I think speaks to that directly, okay? Um, the painting of the uh, very famous early painting of Botticelli, Adoration of the Magi, right? This is where he's really, he's, he's making his mark in Florence. He's, he's, he's 30 years old. Um, he's just, he's been apprenticed. He's had the best training an artist could ever hope for. Um, you know, he was, he worked in the bottega of um, um, Lippo Lippi, the, you know, the, the extraordinary uh, 1460s painter. He had trained as a goldsmith as well, and you know he had sort of gotten the, the, the best education imaginable. He comes into the Medici orbit through uh, Tommaso Soderini, who's the, basically the general manager of the Medici Bank, who becomes an early patron of his and has him uh, pay, uh, commissions him to do a work on fortitude, you know, representing the the, the merchant's uh, value of fortitude, one of the, the so-called virtue paintings. So he's on the rise, and this cements his reputation in 1430, in 1475. Uh, He's 30 years old. And, you know, it's, I mean, look at this. I hate to use that word branding. It's a little glib, but come on. <laughs> you know, here he is. Here are all his patrons in the middle. Here are his, the guys who will be his future patrons on the side. The atmosphere, it's a very good painting. I mean, it's beautiful, right? It's so different, though, from the drawings in the sense that... Um, you don't sense the spiritual questing in this one. You don't sense the late style. Here you sense an artist who's doing a, a magnificent job in executing a commission that is going to pay all sorts of dividends, right? Um, he's not in his prime yet. He's still a young man. You know, the, the Primavera and the, the, um, the uh, birth of Venus are in the 1480s when he's really, that's his decisive decade. But you can see that this is more about a desire to establish your reputation. This is going to be hung in the most prominent place, you know, one of the big chapels. Um, so this is great advertising. This is, you know, a Bottega couldn't ask for more. Um, as things change, you know, we, we're cautioned about reading biography into the work, but if you don't read Bible, then, you know, these are human beings, right? So Botticelli, you know, Botticelli 
His, his patron Giuliano is, is, is murdered in 1478. His muse dies. His big patron Lorenzo dies in 1494. Not just Botticelli's big patron, but the greatest patron in the history of Florentine art. So, and after that, Savonarola comes on the scene, and they start burning works of art. And Botticelli's brother, Simone, was a follower. So um, we don't have direct evidence of him following Savonarola, but if you look at the later paintings, the mystic nativity, I urge you to look at that. I should have showed it from 1501. It's totally different. There's apocalyptic imagery. There's no more frolicking gods and goddesses. There's no more well-heeled patrons in them. It's, it's, it's much more spiritual. It's much more autumnal. It's much more melancholic than these early paintings. That's right, that's right. And so I see the Dante drawings as transitional because they have qualities of both. It's, it's, you can't look at them and not be blown away by the beauty and the kind of, you know, the, the, the analogs between the Venus, the mythological Venus and Beatrice. They're there. They're, they're dancing. He and uh, Beatrice are dancing in heaven, Dante and Beatrice. But they are also very spiritual and contemplative. I didn't say Christian. I mean, they may have a Christian inflection. I can't know that definitively at this point, but there certainly is something thoughtful, contemplative, and questioning about them. Um, so, you know, Botticelli, um, his work changed. He's, if you look at some late paintings of his, he starts to mail it in a bit. Uh, if you look at his workshop of the 1490s, there's this one painting, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it's from 1494, where it's a pretty banal painting, like workmanlike. And then there's this beautiful portrait in the right and the left of it of Raphael and Tobias the Saints, which, which Botticelli did. That's all he did, though. <laughs> he left this entire rest of the canvas to his workshop. So as he aged, you know, he wanted to sign it, if you will, with these two figures. Later in his life, um, some of the, the attentiveness, the, um, the kind of no-nonsense, you know, artistic vision, um, it, it's not as even as early in his career. So Vasari's totally right. He's totally right. Something has changed in this painter. Uh, he's looking for something, I think. And I see the Dante drawings as the key. Why? He spent over a decade on them. That's a long time. He he didn't he was he doesn't have a work like the Sistine Chapel of Michelangelo, you know, which he spent comparable amount of time on. This is the the work that he spent the most time on in his entire life. An artist this talented, this brilliant. Um, so he obviously was drawn to Don. It was more than just a commission to him. You see, so um, I think that he saw something in the poem, and you know. I can't help, but I don't want to read too much into it because I would be speculating, but you can't read the Divine Comedy, spend 10 years illustrating it, and not in some way be taken by its message of, you know, spiritual yearning and, you know, Dante's the exile. I think Botticelli late in his life felt like an exile. I think when he, when, you know, when he comes back from Rome, things are already different in 1481. It'll never, he'll never do paintings like this again. This is a consummate insider painting, you see? Um, and I wish I had an older work, as I said, to show you what an outsider painting looked like. Um, but he did internalize that sense of exile that Dante writes about explicitly, to your point about looking for something. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir? Um, that was a splendid lecture. And uh, I'm reminded of what Mark Twain said on the subject, quote, you only need one lecture, but you can give it different names because people like a choice. <laughs> <laughs> Good, I'll keep naming the different things. <laughs> and um, may I ask, do you know what uh, a miner in, in Nevada said to Oscar Wilde on the subject of Botticelli? No. Well, he was, Wilde was touring in the United States, and he was doing the obvious things, the tea parties in, yeah. in Philadelphia, teaching uh, you know, ladies about William Morris wallpaper. Yeah, no. But he went down into the mines in mm. Nevada, mm. And, and it was so hot down there that the young miners were shirtless. And he said to them, they looked like Botticelli, mm. uh, angels. And, um, and he lectured uh, about Botticelli to them. Mm. And he, his favorite story is when he got back to London, 
he reported that one of them said, if this Botticello fellow is everything you say he is, why the hell didn't you bring him along with you? <laughs> which, which shows, you know, how um, on the one hand, famous, but also no one would have said that about Michelangelo, right? <laughs> that he's a kind of um, obscure enough. I mean, it's interesting, too, you mentioned Wilde, because that's really the generation. Uh, there's two big centers where Botticelli's being rehabilitated. One is late 19th century England, Victorian England, and the other one is Germany. Uh, what I didn't tell you about the drawings is after they end up in Germany in 1882, What's astonishing is this, and my, this is really, my, my book is, is about this. Um, the drawings, believe it or not, end up divided during the Cold War <laughs> into East and West Berlin. <laughs> some are in East Berlin, some are in West Berlin. They almost become an index of like modern history. They're only reunited after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So there's a flurry of activity about them. There's been a bunch of exhibits. You know, everyone, they're, not, they're no secret to anybody. But what is a secret is it's a relatively new thing. It's only been, we've only had them with us for about 25, 30 years. They were, they were divided during the Cold War into East. And I love, the idea of these in East Berlin, you know, um, and some in East, some in West, uh, that's quite extraordinary. So... The drawings have a life of their own. That's, that's what I think really convinced me to write the book. That I think they're wonderful readings, but if I, you know, if I write a, that would just be, an, that would be an academic article or a book, Dante's, Botticelli's interpretation of Dante. Um, there's a lot of that, a lot of art historical work on this. But the drawings have their own life, like the Divine Comedy, right, which we don't have the original. Um, the, the drawings have their, their career, as it were. Thank you for that wonderful story. Thank you. Yes? Uh, <clears throat> I agree. Excellent uh, presentation. Uh, the vignette about Nastaccio, um, are you inferring, are you going there that it's a, um, an allegory that you're, you're ultimately thinking deserves further contemplation? And if so, are you thinking this could have some very interesting points in today's uh, contemporary society? No, how do you mean allegory? Uh, well, that it's illustrative of some principles and virtues or, or some... some no, I, I think it's the opposite. Issues. What's that? <laughs> I think it's the opposite. I, I think, you know, I think that um, what the story is interpreted, at least literally, it becomes this kind of warning, um, you know, that uh, these, these, these women are... Um, you know, not acceding to male codes of power as much as they should, which to us today is, of course, ridiculous, absurd, that this woman, you know, um, she has every right to not want to marry Nastagio. <laughs> and the way Boccaccio handles it is so bizarre. Um, I don't think Botticelli handles it like that. I think what's fascinating is if we could translate Botticelli's painting into words, which of course we can't do, it would be very different from what Boccaccio ending is. In other words, I, I don't see the, um, you know, this is such an extraordinary scene. I see it almost, I don't want to say satirical, but um, it's so over the top, this, you know, uh, this affirmation of patriarchy that um, is steroidal <laughs> and it's, its scope. And I think that it, it's such a contrast to these paintings where, you know, I, I, you know, they say Antonioni was a woman's director. He made films that understood women. I think Botticelli is a, a woman's painter. I think that he, um, uh, he, he, he understands what it means to be a woman and a male dominated society. So if there's an allegory, I think it would be anti bocaccio Thank you. Yes. Yes. And 
Well, you know, first of all, uh, he, the illustrations are done before Savonarola's ascent. So the illustrations are done probably around 1490, and Savonarola doesn't start, you know, kicking things up until the mid to late 1490s. But I think what you said is absolutely possible. I, I really don't have a firm grasp of what Botticelli's ultimate vision in making the decisions he did in Infer. You can look at the miniatures, and there is a visual tradition of illustrating Dante. But nothing is completely analogous to what he's doing. I think he spent so much time with the poem, and he wasn't a miniaturist. He wasn't, you know, he, he was too talented to just be a mere illustrator. Um, he he developed this reading and made this decision where he just wasn't going to give us the personaggi, the characters. In a sense, per, perhaps my sense, and this is just pure speculation. Uh, I think in the beginning of the poem, he was struggling to get traction. He was uh, unlettered. He was no great scholar in the traditional sense. He was trying to understand the poem. He had Landino's edition. I think he was trying to like, map it out, get a real sense of the lay of the land. And once he got that, you know, and the poem changes in Purgatory and Paradiso, he seems to be much more comfortable with the poem. It's less, these illustrations are less busy, less crowded. There's, there's more of a focus to them, more of a, a kind of thesis, if you will. And I think that's, that's a function of his comfort. He seems more comfortable, both with Purgatory and Paradiso, doctrinally and also uh, intellectually. And whereas, in, in, maybe not intellectually, I think, I think really in the beginning of hell, he's, he's trying to, to make sense of Dante. You know, it's an incredibly complex poem. I, I teach Dante. And I always have this experience. I don't know, Allison, if you experience this. You know, I, I recommend people say, oh, I want to read Dante. And I recommend them read Dante. And they come back to me two weeks later and say, huh? <laughs> Why did you? It's a really tough poem to just pick up and read on your own, you know? I mean, I think it's a poem that's really best studied, right? And you just think of poor Botticelli. You know, he's, he's, uh, he's a working class family. Um, as a completely art school, didn't go to art school, but he's an apprenticeship. He doesn't go to college, he doesn't study Dante, he doesn't have the library of someone like, you know, Michelangelo would have had his disposal. And so he's making sense of this poem. Um, and he wasn't the only one, by the way. A lot of the artists, Brunelleschi, you know, they, they breathe Dante. Uh, there's a wonderful book by um, uh, Sacchetti, Trecento Novelle, where 300 stories where Dante becomes this character who walks through Florence and insults blacksmiths who are misquoting his poetry. You know, Dante was a real pop cultural figure. And, um, you know, one of the things I'm writing about is um, in becoming a pop cultural icon, you know, that, that infuriated some people, especially Petrarch, who was very jealous of his reputation um, and who kind of, you know, was struggling with Boccaccio. He knew Boccaccio was a great Dantista. Um, and Boccaccio gave these famous lectures on Dante towards the end of his life, but um, not without a lot of reservations. Uh, he, his attitudes on Dante had evolved from the 1350s when he was really, you know, wrote this laudatory vita about Dante. By 1370s, when he's given the lectures and Petrarch has kind of worked on him for a couple decades, Dante's uh, Boccaccio's understanding of Dante is admiration, but also a little bit of reserve about um, Dante's popular streak and Dante's common touch. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.